Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo. As you know, yesterday we covered three breakout players for the defense for the 2021 season. And today we're going to head over to the offensive side of the ball, talk about a few playmakers who we think can actually have fantastic upcoming seasons and why, you know, they will because the Giants really allocated a lot of resources towards upgrading the offense this offseason. Obviously, $4 million, $72 million, or rather, four years, $72 million to Kenny Galladay. We drafted Kadarius Tony, John Ross, Kyle Rudolph, couple of big uh, names there and, you know, productive players who can offer us different things in specific portions of the field, like Kyle Rudolph, maybe in the red zone. He's a six foot six tight end. Kenny Galladay, six four, a really nice blanket receiver. Um, your ex on the outside also played in the slot so he can travel inside. But today we want to focus on three guys who may have underwhelmed in the past, may have not shown us everything that they're capable of and that we think could have a breakout season um, this year. And Anthony and I, and I have differing opinions on one of these players. Uh, so we'll be excited. Well, I'm excited to really talk to him about that and get into to the intricates of why I think this guy could end up having a good 2020 year and really breaking out because he hasn't <laughs> after four years in the NFL. Um, before we dive into these players, though, Anthony, my friend, how are you doing today? I'm doing real good. I am excited for the 2021 season, excited to see what this offense can do. Um, you know, they kind of were putrid last year, right? The Giants offense was horrible in 2020. Defense was really good, carried us through a lot of games, won us quite a few games. Um, you know, you think back to the Seattle game, we did not win that game due to good offense. We won that game due to a dominant defense. So I'm excited for that to kind of change in 2021, see this offense improve, see more of a group effort. This is a team sport after all. And if you want to be a playoff team, you're not going to get to the playoffs just because of a good defense. You're going to have to have some capable players playing on the offensive side of the ball as well. So I'm excited because the Giants did add a lot of talent and we have some young Young players on offense that haven't had their breakout seasons yet and it seems like they're due in 2021 to have that breakout season whether they started to improve in 2020 and we're hopeful for them to break out in 2021 or if it's just time and this is their make or break year as one of these players Alex and I are disagreeing on is going to be make or break you got to break out now or never right so that's a common theme in the NFL and oftentimes that'll lead players to crumble and become nothing or iron sharpens iron pressure makes you know hot metal and we will get a really really good player out of this 2021 season it's possible though to me it seems a little unlikely with a certain player that we're going to discuss but I'm excited to discuss it regardless and on my Manscaped t-shirt make sure you go check out Manscaped use our discount code for 20% off code fireside love the products using them they're great Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're, we're in the dead of off season, my friends. This is, you know, you're, you're sitting outside in the heat in the car and you don't know what to do. No air conditioning. It's brutal. They're just, they haven't even turned my AC on in my apartment building yet. It's freaking annoying. I'm sweating. It's hot. Can't sleep at night. So if you see those bags under my eyes, they're definitely not Gucci. Those are those knockoff Gucci ones you got on the side of the street in New York City. Awful. But my friends, the first guy we're going to talk about is none other than left tackle Andrew Thomas. And Andrew Thomas had a really tough rookie season, as we know. You know, double-digit sacks he allowed, really had some struggles early on, getting beat inside, you know, cardinal sin for offensive tackles. And his feet lagged behind him. As we know, he had an injury that occurred in training camp. He had surgery postseason um, to fix that issue, and it really bothered him. You could tell that his fundamentals were off. Um, multiple offensive line coaches throughout the season chimed in, including Paul Alexander, and he said, this is not the Andrew Thomas we saw at Georgia. I mean, this is not the hog molly, strong, young, agile Andrew Thomas that we saw that had the highest floor of this entire draft class. This is a different version of him, and I think it was a mixture of Mark Colombo's technique and what he was teaching him, and also the injury that was you know, hurting his mobility, and he really was not underneath of himself. He, had, he found himself leaning over a lot. His recoveries were off. Um, he just really did not look like himself uh, compared to college. You know, everything about him was just kind of thrown through a loop. And it was unfortunate to see him kind of take that nosedive. But now heading into the 2021 season, all those negative factors are behind him, right? We have an established coach in Rob Sale who's going to be here for the entirety of the season. This is a hand-picked coach from Joe Judge, which I'm very excited about because all the coaches that Joe Judge seemed to pick seem to pan out for the most part. Um, now, you know, rolling over to Andrew Thomas – you have a player who now will have a preseason to iron out any kinks. You have the in-person training, not as much virtual stuff and overall voluntary you know, camp and whatnot. He'll probably end up showing up sooner, sooner rather than later. And I think all of these different factors are going to roll over and really build into a much more efficient and productive season as long as he can stay healthy. There's no way he gets worse compared to last year after being injured, having no time to learn the scheme, no time to put that system and scheme to live action before a week one matchup against the best defense in the NFL and the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
he, it was just it was just baptism by fire and you know the fire was scorching hot because it was he didn't really have any time to get uh, his feet out under him plus the injury so with all those factors you know included I'm making the educated guess that he's going to have a far better 2021 season. I think he's going to be a breakout player. I think he's going to do really, really well at uh, protecting Daniel Jones's blind side, simply because we need him to. You know, the, the Giants need Andrew Thomas to step up. Daniel Jones needs time. He needs to be able to trust that he's not going to be railed um, uh, from the from the back. Uh, pause. Um, <laughs> I, that was in my head. It was it was unraveling, and I was like, ah, I'm too far. I can't. <laughs> I'm too far. Major pause, Alex. Major pause. Major this happens pause. way too often to you. We got to keep you under lock. I gotta... thought about it, too, and I couldn't think of anything to substitute it with in time. So, yes, he got railed from the back. Pause. We get it. Ha ha. <laughs> oh, I'm a child. Um, <laughs> I'm a straight child. But Andrew Thomas now, I think he's going to have a far better season. Anthony, do you think the same? Um, please don't try to make any more pause situations because I just can't handle them at the moment. I'll try not to, and I absolutely do think that Andrew Thomas will improve in 2021. He's my number one player that I, that I think will have a breakout on the Giants offense. I just wrote an article about it earlier this week, so I'll read a few excerpts from that. Um, of course, we know that Andrew Thomas was the first of six offensive tackles taken in the first round of the 2020 NFL Draft. The Giants thought of him really highly, took him ahead of guys like Tristan Wirfs and Jedrick Wills. Now, Tristan Wirfs played at a near all-pro level, almost made an all-pro team, did make the PFF all-pro team for the midseason he was phenomenal and he even got a Super Bowl ring in his rookie season so good for Tristan Wirfs you know if you can go back to last year probably 10 out of 10 times on a redo you're taking Tristan Wirfs over Andrew Thomas but that's not to say that the long-term outlook isn't positive on Andrew Thomas just means that Tristan Wirfs had a great year one and so did Jedrick Wills playing left tackle for the Cleveland Browns a lot of people were worried since he played right tackle in college he wouldn't make that transition well he made it really well over to left tackle for the Cleveland Browns, and he was very impressive as a rookie as well. And Andrew Thomas struggled. He struggled really badly as a rookie, he struggled a lot more than those two counterparts, and honestly struggled more than even Mekhi Becton, the guy who was really more boom or bust, went 11 overall to the New York Jets. But that's not to say that Andrew Thomas was terrible and showed no signs of improvement. Okay, so in the first eight games of the 2020 season, he allowed three or more pressures in every single one of those games. Now, that is a terrible statistic, and that says, oh, my God, Andrew Thomas is horrible, looks like a bust, right? Second half of the season, though, he improved a lot. Over those eight games, he allowed three or more pressures in only three of the Giants' last eight games. And one of them was that disastrous game against the Arizona Cardinals, but... To go from every single game with three-plus pressures to only three is definitely a lot of improvement on the second half of the year. You know, clearly the Giants needed to get rid of Mark Colombo. Whatever was going on there was not benefiting Andrew Thomas, and they invested way too much into their left tackle position to see their offensive tackle get ruined by a offensive line coach who's just not doing the job properly. Um, Pro Football Focus also mentioned in their article about the most underrated player in 2020 for the Giants. Um, they mentioned that Andrew Thomas had his technique reworked significantly. They did all the tape analysis from his college seasons to his rookie season said his technique was completely reworked by the Giants. They did it all over again, started from scratch. It was a whole new game that he was learning. That's tough. That's a huge learning curve, right? So then by the end of the year, once he started to figure out this technique, he was a lot better. Um, so as I wrote, he struggled significantly in pass protection. Um, but in college, he never allowed two or more pressures in a game since 2017. So he knows what to do. He just, I, I don't know, something went wrong this year. He allowed the most pressures of any offensive tackle in the season with 57. Like, those are bad numbers that don't make sense. They don't correlate to his college play. In college, he was so good, phenomenal pass protector. For it to just go to the can like it did in 2020 didn't really make a lot of sense. But I think, you know, as the season ended, we got the answers on that. Clearly, there was a lot of reworking of technique that was messing with him right but then we also found out he was dealing with a significant foot injury ankle injury something like that needed surgery at the end of the year now let's take into account that this man was playing hobbled the entire season and his footwork was really bad all season might have something to do with the ankle surgery that he just had right second half of the year when he started he'll feel better he earned just one pff pass blocking grade below 59.0 over the second half of the season despite every single outing before week eight falling below 59.0 the one disastrous game against arizona other than that every single passing block grade um from week eight onwards was above 70.0 which is a really good grade and pro football focuses metrics so he really improved as a pass protector in the second half of the season 
and that gives me a lot of confidence going into 2021 with a new offensive line coach who's hopefully much better than Marco Lumbo. I assume that he will be. New offensive line coach, much healthier version of Andrew Thomas. Just had his ankle surgery. He's expected to be fully healthy for the season. Plus, he was improving drastically by the season's end last year. I think this kid's going to break out in a major way this season and establish himself as a really, really good blindside protecting offensive tackle. And I'm really excited for that. I'm very high on Andrew Thomas. I know a lot of people are really low on him because of that bad rookie season. Not me. I saw enough. I saw a lot of flashes of excellent play. I saw him do a lot of great things in run defense as well, or run blocking as well. I think that he's going to step up in a major way this season and really break out as a franchise left tackle. Yeah, and to build on that, you know, he really, uh, you know, when it comes to the Giants offense, (laughs) defensives are just rushing the passer with extra guys. You know, we're talking about two, three guys on one tackle at times. And how are you supposed to stop that if you're Andrew Thomas? You know, you're playing cover one, cover zero, manning up across the board, send an extra linebacker, send an extra safety, send a cornerback off the off the edge. You, you can't you can't stop everybody. The guy's not an octopus. You know, he doesn't have eight arms. So at the end of the day, he's going to get hit with some of those. If it's on his side and he's, he's near him, he's going to get hit with that sack. He's going to get hit with that hurry, that pressure. It's going to be on him. But the Giants didn't have any weapons to help him out either. So it is what it is. I think, you know, Andrew Thomas, as you mentioned, was a very adequate run blocker last year. The pass protection was his major concern. He was not a bad run blocker whatsoever. And I see his future bright. I see this is not an Eric Flower situation. This is not a guy who has terrible balance. This is not a guy who essentially was a turnstile at a mall. You know what I mean? This is, this is a player who is adequate. He's a good player. He just had some issues because of COVID, because of the lack of in-person training, because of the lack of preseason, the injury. Eric Flowers doesn't have any excuses, man. You know, <laughs> only excuse he has is he looked like he didn't give a crap when he played for the Giants. Kind of looked like Devonta Smith right now with the Eagles. Guy can't catch a freaking cold. So here we are, moving on to number two. And this is the one that Anthony and I have differences about. This is the one player who I think had all pro, not even all pro, maybe pro bowl level potential right out of college, and that's Will Hernandez. I have been just so disappointed at what Will Hernandez has been able to put on the field the past few years. And the guy's also been put through the ringer, man. He's gone through, what, two offensive tackles, two offensive schemes. The guy last year, he didn't get to learn the scheme. He didn't get to apply it. Same thing with the rest of the offensive line, which is why they all struggled for the most part. None of them were able to apply. This was, by the way, this was Kevin Zeitler's worst year of his career. So, you know, tell me, tell me why. Why is it his worst year of his career? Probably because they had no time to learn the system. They had no time to apply it. The players around him were struggling because of that, and it made him look even worse. You know, so I think when you see a player like that who was adequate every single season have a down year, there's a reason for it. You know, there's, there's factors, you know, that you can justify um, as excuses. Now, I don't want to make excuses for anybody because I think they all are making millions of dollars playing professional football, but at the end of the day, you know, this training and practice time is essential for their development and growth. When it comes to Will Hernandez, the guy went through the ringer last year too. Aside from all the factors I just listed, he caught COVID. And his trainer said he was injured the whole year. You know, so he was injured and he caught COVID. Imagine if Andrew Thomas was injured and got COVID, which seriously debilitates um, your ability to, you know, maintain your stamina and, you know, run consistently and move consistently without pretty much getting weak. I mean, there's a couple NBA players, I forget who they were, who contracted COVID and, and, and have had to use um, inhalers for the first time in their life. You know, so when you're looking at Will Hernandez, I'm, I'm sure he kicked his ass. He still went back out on the field and he played his heart out. And I, and I respect him for that more than you can know. You know, I, a very admirable thing to do, especially him and Matt Parrott. And that's the other guy that is on this list that... Uh, um, Anthony thinks actually should be the other breakout player. I think it's Will Hernandez. I think Matt Pear could equally break out as well, but I think Hernandez is actually going to come back very strong. I think he lost a little bit of weight this offseason. I think he's going to be a little bit more agile, a little bit quicker. He's going to fit our scheme a little bit more. Um, he's going to have a better Andrew Thomas, a better Nick Gates. He's going to have a better processing Daniel Jones with more weapons to take blitzers away. He's experienced. I think he's set up to succeed right now. He really is. He's set up to succeed. He's He's been training with Duke Mannyweather. Um, he's ha- he has better offensive linemen with him based on the experience. Andrew Thomas will come back better. Nick Gates was a lot better at the end of the year. Daniel Jones, you know, did develop in most categories last year, um, just aside from the obvious things that went against him in terms of not having weapons, bad play calling, um, all that crap. I really do think that Will Hernandez is going to have a solid year. Andrew Thomas and Will Hernandez. That's why the Giants 
didn't make any moves on the offensive line, right? I like to think they know more than us. I like to think Joe Judge knows more than us. So the fact that they didn't do anything there it says a lot to me about, you know, how they feel, their optimism toward this offensive line. You know what I mean? Like the average Twitter GM or the average Instagram poster has no idea what's going on behind the scenes. You know, they have no idea how hard Will Hernandez is working or how much they think this offseason is going to influence and impact his future success. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt. If they didn't make any moves, I trust Joe Judge. I know Anthony does too. If they didn't make any moves, it's because they know what they're doing. They had the money for it. They sure as hell had the money for it. They could have, they could have easily passed on John Ross, passed on a couple other guys, allocated all that money toward another interior guard, like Gabe Jackson, for example. You know, a couple million there. That's how I feel about it. I think Will Hernandez is going gonna, is gonna to take a nice step forward. I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised. And I'll hopefully be sitting here looking like a hero, not an idiot. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I trust in Joe Judge always, and I trust that, you know, the coaches have more information than us always, right? Which is one of the reasons why I'm so high on Matt Parrott, because I know that they are high on Matt Parrott. Um, I think that Matt Parrott is more in line for breakout season, though, than Will Hernandez personally, right? I think that Joe Judge and company are very high on Matt Parrott. They've said that. They said he was playing hurt at the end of last season. That's the only reason that he didn't start to finish the year. So, I see a lot of, you know, positives with Matt Parrott, and I see their confidence in him, but with Will Hernandez, for them to have benched him for the second half of the season last year like they did really does not instill a ton of confidence from them into Will Hernandez for me personally. Understand he was playing hurt, understand he had COVID, but at the end of the day, he wasn't playing well, and he wasn't the player that we wanted or expected him to be, so... You look at him and his rookie season. We all said, oh my God, this is was this was a great rookie season. Will Hernandez has a ton of potential. I could see him just going better and better from here on out. Then he just kind of meddled around the same and even got a little bit worse. I feel like he kind of already hit his ceiling personally. I don't know if I see him breaking out. I do see him maybe returning to form to that rookie season form. That would be his breakout, getting back to his best play. But I don't see him really surpassing that level or getting any higher than that because, I mean, it's been three years now, and every year has just gotten worse and worse. It's kind of hard to see him just becoming this overnight better player than he was his rookie season. I think that was his ceiling. I do ultimately think he reaches that ceiling once again. Um, I think that the pieces around him are better. I think, you know, he's got more time to learn a scheme, more in-person training, um, better offensive line coach. You know, he's got a lot of factors going for him. He'll be healthier. He probably, I, I really hope, doesn't get COVID again. Um, you know, Will Hernandez has all the factors going for him to return to form. It's just, that's all I see this being in terms of a breakout year for him. This is the make or break. This is who we were talking about before we got into the discussions, nuanced. This guy is make or break this year. He has to perform. It's his fourth year. This is the last year of his contract. If he doesn't perform this year, I'm ready to say goodbye. I'm ready to look to the next draft and replace him. Look to the next free agency period and replace him. Look to maybe somebody on the roster. Like, you have to break out in year four. If you don't, I don't really know what to say about it, Will Hernandez. I really hope you do break out. I, I really think that he has a good chance to return to form, but that's personally what I see. I just see him returning I to think, his rookie I, I form. Disagree. I, I don't I disagree. think that he gets much higher than that. I feel like that's his ceiling. I, I see why you think that, but I also feel like it's fair to acknowledge the fact that he's been put in absolutely terrible positions the last few years. I mean, with Pat Shermer, uh, with even Joe Judge last year, it's not even really his fault. The guy went through two offensive court, uh, rather uh, offensive line coordinators, the injuries, the COVID, the this, the that, the change in scheme. He really, like, okay, we didn't, we can't really properly evaluate Will Hernandez until we see him this season. That, that That's kind of how I feel about it. Maybe his rookie season was his ceiling, but I don't think so. I don't, I don't want to buy into that because he's in a contract year. If he plays well, the Giants will get him at cost. You know what I mean? We, we desperately want Will Hernandez to play well this year because they'll get him at a cheaper price than if he played well all four years. You know, the Giants are heading toward a position where they are ready to win in the near future. And if he plays well, they can sign him for much cheaper than he would have been um, otherwise, and I think the Giants are still very high on him. Obviously, Duke Mannyweather thinks so. They've been training together. He's lost a little bit of weight. If you saw him compared to Matt Parrott, the guy is like, he, he lost size. Like, he is very much a smaller person right now. Um, Two different and I'll tell positions, you, I, think, I mean, Matt no, no, Parrott has always been a six foot seven, know, long arm beast who's going to be a Pro Bowl level left or right tackle at some point in his career. That's Matt Parrott, dude. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully that's the case. I'm praying for that as well. But with Will Hernandez, I think he's changed his body. He's changed his technique. He's, he's adapting to this scheme. Um, 
and last year was we couldn't judge it properly. You know, we couldn't. I'm not going to sit here and say last year uh, was was a fair opportunity for us to say he's not the guy in the future. And I think if the Giants I, felt as though they didn't have a starting left guard or right guard, don't you think they would have allocated resources there? They unless they sign a free agent somehow, like at some point this offseason, they must feel as though Shane Lemieux or Zach Fulton or Will Hernandez are capable of being starters. So that's kind of how I feel. Okay. About it. Yeah, I think that they would have allocated resources if the value was there. They said they were targeting multiple offensive linemen. They wanted Landon Dickerson. He got selected before them. Like They wanted to allocate resources to that position. They didn't find the value, and ultimately that's why they didn't. But they wanted to. They wanted to make an upgrade, just couldn't. So I, I think that kind of is a good counterargument to that point. And then also, I know he had a lot of factors going against him last year, but what the hell happened in 2019, his so- sophomore season? He was in the second year of a scheme. Second year of a scheme, you're supposed to improve. He was supposed to get better that year. Go put on the film from that Week 10 matchup in 2019 against the Jets and go watch how terrible him, Spencer Poley, and everyone else on the interior was in run blocking. It was just atrocious. So what happened to him then? Why did he take such a huge step backwards after his rookie season? No, he wasn't a great run blocker in his rookie season. That's where we wanted him to improve, but he got so much worse in his sophomore season. He was a pretty damn good pass protector in his rookie season. Year two, took a huge step backwards. So I just don't understand the regression from year one to two, and then year three again, another regression. Understand he had a lot going against him in year three, but he didn't really have a lot going against him in year two. He had a lot going for him in year two, and I thought that he really should have improved that year and not regressed the way that he did. That was my first red flag. I was hoping for a bounce back with a new scheme in year three. Didn't see it. I'm a little more lukewarm than most people are on Will Hernandez, I feel. I don't see him breaking out being much more than he was his rookie season. That, to me, that'll be his ceiling, and I really hope that he reaches out again because let's not get it twisted. That rookie season was really good. Like, that is above average level interior offensive line play. That's all you need in the NFL. You don't need elite guards, but you need something above average. So if he can at least just return to an above average form, I'm totally happy with it, and I'll be really high on Will Hernandez going forward, but I just need to see him return to that average to above form because right now he's playing at a below average level, and it's not cutting it, and it's dangerous for Daniel Jones, and it's dangerous for Saquon Barber. We need somebody who can pass protect and run block and be at least average in those facets going forward. Yeah, objection, Your Honor, because, <laughs> because. Is that a I Joe Judge pun? On... Since I'm the leader of the Joe <laughs> yeah, Judge fan go. club. Exactly. That was an accidental <laughs> pun. I'll take it, though. I'll take it. When it comes to Will Hernandez, I do want to add this for his first two seasons. Would you grade or how would you? How, okay. The way I want to put this is. Do you think that Nate Solder was a good left tackle for us the first two years that he was here? Maybe the first year. The second year, he was awful. I thought year one, he looked decent, especially as a run blocker. Pass protection was a mess. Year two, he took a step backwards, and so did Will Hernandez. So, yeah, there might be some correlation there. How about the center position? How about Spencer Pulley, who was a backup on most teams? Guys are not even signed right now, I don't think. Well, actually, it was Spencer Hel- or Spencer Pulley was the backup. Oh, it was John Halapio. Who literally John Halapio was starting. Yeah, he, yeah, he should well, never. He, he kept getting injured, and then Spencer Pulley was getting thrown into the mix. So, look, this is if we are going to apply the same concept with Daniel Jones not playing well at times because he doesn't have the weapons and offensive line. We also have to look at Will Hernandez and say if he has a shitty left tackle and a shitty center next to him, how are we supposed to how are we how are we supposed to justify him succeeding? How are we supposed to expect him to succeed when the Giants put absolute garbage cans around him? You know what I mean? So look, I, I understand what you're saying. I get the fact that Will Hernandez probably um, may, may have even reached his ceiling in his rookie year because and and it's interesting now for me to think about because you think about Nate Solder, he had his best season his rookie year when Nate Solder had his best year. And then he took a massive step backward when Nate Solder had his worst year. And then you had John Jalapio get injured. You had a rotation at center, and they were always bad there anyway. You know what I mean? So it all seems like it coincides with each other and the, and the faults that, that were around him and the inadequacies, which is why I'm, I'm bullish on, on Will Hernandez this year. I think he, he's a breakout candidate. Um, do I think he's going to be an all-pro level player? No, of course not. Is he going to be a Pro Bowl player? Maybe not. But if he plays... Just below Pro Bowl level, just below Pro Bowl level, that's a breakout for him, in my opinion. You know, that's that's what we need. That's what well, I that's what I'm saying. I just need someone who's at least slightly above average. So if he can reach that level again, I'm happy about it. But we already saw him do that. So is it a breakout? I don't know. I think it would be more of a return to form, and you know, 
breakout concern in his last two seasons were so bad, and he breaks out to become average once again. So yeah, I, I guess it's a breakout to return to form. But I also I will reaffirm your point and agree with you. Um, going into last season, the number one thing that I said was I'm afraid of this offensive line because of the lack of continuity. Okay, you had no continuity across the board on the offensive line, and I think that's you know ultimately really important for offensive linemen to develop that chemistry, to build off of one another and build together, right? Um, now, I guess this year, at least, we have Hernandez. He's played alongside Thomas before, or he's played alongside um, Nick Gates before, so whichever side he's on, at least there's some continuity there. But again, there's going to be some overturn. We're going to have a new starter at right guard. We're going to have a new starter at right tackle. At least the left side should remain a little bit more consistent. But continuity is key for offensive line play. The Giants haven't had much continuity. And the major red flag for continuity was when they fired an offensive line coach midseason. So hopefully getting into in-person training, getting one singular offensive line coach to coach this unit from season to start to season's end. Hopefully that continuity will bring things together, help them build that chemistry, and play better together. Because you're right, it is very dependent on who they have around him. You know, Will Hernandez, if he's the only good offensive lineman on the team, he's not going to be very good because he's going to be overcompensating for the faults of his teammates. So yes, it is true. You need good players around certain players for them to succeed. And I think that the Giants' offensive line is going to have some improvement from its left tackle, from its right tackle, and from its center. So hopefully those guard positions get better just because those guys around them are getting better. Yeah, and you know, it's it's kind of popping into my head now that when you see what good coaches are capable of doing, looking at the secondary and in that interior defensive line, when you look at them, you say, okay, you can have good players, but if you don't have good coaching, it falls apart pretty quickly. The offensive line has had absolute shite coaching for the last like five years. Hal Hunter guy was blindfolded trying to teach technique. It's, it seemed like. I can't even. I can't. Don't even get start. me started on Hal Hunter. Everyone knows saying. that I have a real personal beef with that hire. Oh, well, that's what I'm saying. Hal Hunter, guy was blindfolded or had his eyes stabbed out. I don't know exactly what happened with him, but clearly, major problems. Major problems to, uh, developing that offensive line, especially those young talents like Will Hernandez. Now you have Mark Colombo fired again. At least it didn't take the Giants five years to do it this time. It took him half a season when Joe Judge realized that Mark Colombo was not the answer. They bring in Dave DeGuglielmo because he's pretty much the only veteran guy on the, on the street willing to come in and, and coach this group up. They looked a lot better in the second half. He just wanted to, to be interim kind of thing. I don't think he's looking for a job like that. Clearly, um, you know, he left after the season's end. But now you have Rob Sale, a young guy, motivated young guy. Hal Hunter, he was, he was a kind of an older dude, right? I'm not entirely sure how old he was. Hal Hunter was absolutely an older dude, um, and he was also a dude that was fired from the NFL for coaching one of the historically worst offensive lines in the league with the Cleveland Browns, was out of the league for a full season before returning to the NFL under Pat Shermer's staff the guy's 62. and coaching another terrible staff. Right, the guy is 62 line. years old. Older guy the league is and different. poor coach. Poor coach, <laughs> old guy, not that old guys are bad. Um, just, you know, maybe maybe phased out of the modern approach to the NFL. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Also, his, historically, I don't know why the hell the Giants hired him in the first place if he literally led the worst offensive line in history. God, 66 team, sacks by the Cleveland Browns that this, season. That this team fired. confuses me really to no really end. Bad. No end. This, this team confuses me with our, with our coaching hiring. But I trust Joe Judge, and I think Rob Sale, younger guy, motivated. He's going to come in, he's going to kick ass, and he's going to make our players look better because of it. Good coaching changes everything. I'm so excited to finally have some good coaches who are going to get it done. The Giants had 25 coaches last weekend coaching 22 guys. I love to see that. I freaking love it. So now we have a step forward with Will Hernandez because of that. that. Those are all the factors that I can think of that justify Will Hernandez taking a step forward. And, man, just going through them all really pissed me off, i got to say. It's, it's, really, it's really embarrassing how, how poor the Giants have put together this offensive line and the coaching staff to help them succeed. And I hope you guys are fuming as well because I, I really desperately need to see them take a step forward. For Daniel Jones' sake, I really don't want to have to go through another quarterback crisis in, in developing another guy. I really want DJ to be our franchise quarterback. But let's move on to the last guy, and it is Daniel Jones. We did a whole video two days ago, an hour-long video with film review in it, breaking down why Daniel Jones is capable of being a franchise quarterback. The guy's got the legs, vanilla Vic, you know, had faster runs than Lamar Jackson last year. 80, what quarterback could you say? Even Pat Mahomes was like, I couldn't do that. 80-yard run, even though he stumbled on his ass. 80-yard run, burned the entire secondary. He was going so fast, he lost his wheels. You know what I mean? So here you have a player 
who has the capability to be an awesome modernized, you know, read option type of athlete while also throwing the ball effectively. You know, we see he's an accurate passer. We know the downfield accuracy. And Anthony's going to make a, a really detailed video on that in a couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that one as the, as the dead season rolls along. We'll have some more elite content up for you as always. But Daniel Jones, we showed he showed us flashes last year. That week nine and week 10 games against Washington and Philadelphia, he was clean. He didn't turn the ball over. His throws were accurate. He, I think he had a, overall had a 70% completion percentage, which is fantastic. He was playing phenomenally against Cincinnati before the hamstring injury. It's just the, the touchdowns weren't there. And, and I think a majority of that was because the Giants had, I think, almost double-digit touchdowns from within the opponent's five-yard line with their running backs. Daniel Jones did all the hard work, got the ball all the way down to the, to the goal line, and then just ran it in. So he didn't, get the, he didn't get the touchdown numbers, which, of course, is disappointing because, you know, would have made him look a little bit better. But it points on the board. It points on the board. I don't give a crap where it comes from. I don't give a crap who's scoring as long as we're winning games. So Daniel Jones, we saw what he's capable of doing. If you watch the video, which I assume most of you have, um, you saw what we saw, you know, adequacy, rhythm, accurate throws, deep ball accuracy, <clears throat> pocket awareness, all of these things, ability to move out of the pocket and throw on the run, waiting for his plays to develop, progressing through his reads smoothly. He's a very rhythm-based quarterback, and that injury really threw him off. You know, he, need, he needed that rhythm. Now you have all these weapons, a better schematic, uh, a better scheme, really, to help, uh, you know, maximize his potential. Well, that's what we hope, at least. And I think Daniel Jones is going to have a nice year. I think I don't think it'll be a Stephon Diggs, Josh Allen type of year, but it'll be a Kenny Galladay, Daniel Jones type of year, which could be 25 to 30 touchdowns, which will be a nice step forward. It'll be less fumbles, less interceptions, a higher completion percentage, some zone reads, probably way more rushing yards um, next year. I think you know with more with more unpredictability. I'm excited to see what DJ can do, Anthony. You know, what are you thinking about DJ in the future? Do you think he has that breakout potential? Yeah, I do think he breaks out in 2021. We made that video a couple of days ago, and I was pretty clear. I'm very optimistic about Daniel Jones. I'm very high on him. I do see him as a potential franchise quarterback. I know that the stat sheet in 2020 doesn't show it. 11 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, not a good stat line, but go watch the film. Go look at the premium stats if you need to, the analytics. Go look at more than just the box score, and you'll see that Daniel Jones did have a pretty decent season. He actually was pretty good as a quarterback, especially when throwing from a clean pocket. His grading from a clean pocket was in the 90s. It was elite, but his grading from you know, a pressured pocket wasn't as good. He, he really struggled under pressure, which is understandable. The Giants' offensive line was putrid. Um, but you go through and you look at big-time throws, which is pro football focuses, big stat on throwing the ball basically downfield, those tight windows, those, you know, really tough throws to make, the big-time throws. He had 24 of those this year. So that could have easily been 24 touchdowns rather than just the 10 that he had. Okay, because that's true. Alex mentioned it. A lot of the times he was making big-time throws, Giants were getting down inside the 5-10 yard line because of those throws. Then they were just pounding it in with Wayne Gallman because he was a pretty good runner from within the 5-yard line. So, Daniel Jones was making the plays to get the Giants into scoring position, absolutely. Um, he was a pretty good player in 2020, and the number one stat to back that up is he was the third highest graded quarterback on deep passing this past season. Number one was Aaron Rodgers with a ridiculous 99.7 overall PFF grade on deep throws. I mean, that's insane. Number two was Derek Carr, who some people said was playing at an MVP level at 97.8. Then number three, you had Daniel Jones at 95.6, just narrowly in front of Russell Wilson at 95.1. Daniel Jones threw the ball deep like we haven't seen a quarterback for the Giants do in a number of years, and I understand. Eli Manning was great at throwing the ball deep in his prime, but he's quite a few years past his prime at this point, and now he's into retirement. So when you look at Daniel Jones and his deep passes, deep throws 20-plus yards, as I just mentioned, 95.6 uh, grade, 18 big-time throws on those, and only two turnover-worthy plays, according to Pro Football Focus, on those 20-plus yard throws. That's an incredible rate. To, only, to throw the ball that deep, have six touchdowns, zero interceptions, and only two of those throws could have been intercepted, that's an incredible rate. Only problem for me with his 20-plus yard throws, there just wasn't enough of them. He was so good at them, but he only attempted 43 of them. I need to see that number get up in the 60s. I need more deep passes from Daniel Jones. He's so accurate throwing the ball deep. He loves taking advantage of cornerbacks with their backs to the football. He knows how to just place it right over their head, right in the perfect spot for the receiver to make the play, where only the receiver can make the play. That's what Daniel Jones is really good at. Those back shoulders, those fades, you know, those one-on-one -on -one matchups. He throws it just perfectly nearly every single time. 
I want to see him have more opportunities to do that. Um, Galena from Pro Football Focus wrote an article today basically describing the Giants' offense last season, um, how Garrett was really calling a lot of slant flats and a lot of curl flats, just a lot of short passing concepts. Daniel Jones was very inaccurate on those, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that there was no protection, no um, route running that was capable of creating separation, and a lot of predictability from the quarterback and the offensive coordinator. But on those 20-plus yard throws, Daniel Jones was killing it. He was phenomenal. What they need to do is have more of those. We need more of those plays in this offense, and I think that we'll get them. Now that we have a guy like Kenny Galladay, we have a guy like Kadarius Toney, and we have Freddie Kitchens stepping up into a senior offensive assistant role, plus a nice analytics guy with our offensive quality control coach and Russ Callaway. All signs point to the Giants having a more vertical passing attack, knowing that Daniel Jones is so good at throwing the ball deep, putting more of an emphasis on throwing the ball deep. And I cannot wait. There, that has to be emphasized a lot more than it was in 2020, and I absolutely think it will be. Also, all signs point to it, like I just said. And listen, Daniel Jones throwing the ball deep. I, I mean, I my jaw dropped a few times when he threw some deep balls. That stretch that Alex was talking about from the game against Washington, then Philadelphia, and then the first half of that Bengals game, he was just throwing dime after dime downfield. He had two just perfect throws down each sideline to Evan Engram in the Bengals' first half game. Like, he threw some beautiful balls deep downfield, and he was just getting in stride. That Those were his three weeks. Then the next two weeks, he's injured. The next three weeks, he's injured, and he's not playing the same. He returns to form finally for the end of the season. But just imagine if he had those three games uninterrupted, no injuries. And then he went into that fourth, fifth, and sixth game in a row where he was just throwing dimes downfield and just keeping form. As Alex keeps saying, he's a momentum-based quarterback. I wish that he had that momentum and was able to keep that going. And hopefully this year he stays healthy, the offense emphasizes those deep balls, and he does get that momentum, and he does get to keep going. I think that he's a really good quarterback with a lot of potential, and now that we have all the weapons around him, and hopefully a better offensive coach, coaching staff around him as well, I think that Daniel Jones can absolutely, and I think he absolutely will, break out in 2021. Yeah, you know what? Being a momentum quarterback, this is the last thing I'll say on DJ before we wrap up. The one thing um, that is bad about a momentum-based quarterback is that when things are going poorly, he does not play consistent football. You know, he makes mistakes. He, he um, has lapses in Tampa judgment. Tampa Bay game comes to mind. Exactly. So when you put the weapons around him and give him the opportunity to start gaining momentum, that is what we're hoping for. We're hoping that momentum starts to translate into, you know, bad to average to good to great to elite. That's what we're hoping the momentum takes him. But the laps, the, the injuries at the wrong times, um, the lack of weapons, the lack of you know players around him to help him get there has been his fault. And I think now the Giants have basically given him no excuse. It's now or never. You know The offensive line may be the only excuse he can come up with, but uh, the weapons should take a little bit of pressure off of those guys in the trenches. And I, and I 100% believe that that will be the case. We will see a better offensive line this year, guys. I don't want to guarantee it, but I'm very confident about, about it. And we're going to see a better Daniel Jones because of it, because when he's with a clean pocket, we know what he can do. I mean, Patrick Mahomes, I'm not comparing him to Daniel Jones whatsoever, but the guy has a clean pocket. He had a clean pocket the whole year. He was standing there, standing there, standing there. Oh, my guy's finally open. My, my guy who runs a 4-2 and Tyree Kill is finally open. You know, Daniel Jones is like, snap, I'm already sacked. Snap, I'm already sacked. He was Danny Nickel. We need to get Danny Dimes back. And I hope, uh, I hope that's the case. <laughs> Damn me and my dad jokes. It's fine. That's why you're here, guys. You're here for the dad jokes, not the Giants analysis. But Only here for the dad jokes. But I will say real quickly on the Patrick Mahomes thing, he did have a clean pocket in the regular season. Once those injuries piled up in the postseason, we saw the Daniel Jones thing come into effect where he just couldn't get things done despite being the best football player in the world, has all the arm talent, avoiding pressure at will, just trying so hard to make plays, create space for himself to throw, and it just wasn't enough in that Super Bowl, as we all saw. You need good offensive line play to succeed at the quarterback position. And, you know, even Josh Allen, when he stood in those clean pockets all regular season long, he was throwing dimes to, to Stephon Diggs and Cole Beasley and everybody else. Postseason, he started getting under low pressure. Play kind of came to, you know, the standstill. He kind of started to regress. It's It happens. Quarterbacks regress when they're put under severe pressure. I think Giants fans should know that really, really well, watching Eli Manning's career as the offensive line continued to regress throughout his career. Plus, also watching the Giants win two Super Bowls against the Patriots. Go watch the film. How did they win those games? They pressured Tom Brady. He was on the ground for most of the I was just about to say. That's why they won those say. games. 
good offensive line play. That's what you need to have a successful quarterback. If you don't have mm-hmm. that, what do you have? Yep, top, t- arguably the best team in history, New England Patriots, in that Super Bowl back in 2007. And the Giants, all they needed was a defensive line that was able to put pressure on Brady, and he crumbled. They only scored 14 points that game. Best team in history, arguably. You know, only, only scored 14 points. So you see what an offensive line does for a quarterback. The Giants didn't do much to upgrade it, but I think they, they feel confident with the talent they do have. I would not rule out a potential late-season signing either um, post-camp when they kind of get a, a bunch of guys off the books. Um, guys like Sam Beal, there might be some guys that you know carry kind of a little bit of money with them um, that they can release and roll over to another offensive guard who might be able to compete or rather, rather just go and plug and play. So, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video talking about three breakout candidates for the 2021 season on offense specifically. If you haven't watched a defensive one, go check it back. It's literally yesterday's video, um, or rather on Tuesday if you're watching this on Thursday. Um, but guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Fireside Giants. As always, my friends, once at the Fireside, always at the Fireside. Elite content all the time. The dead period is here in the NFL, but we will not stop grinding. We will come up with the most obscure uh, video ideas that we can possibly conjure. Any updates and news, we will have it to you as soon as we possibly can. And as always, my friends, written and audio and visual, whatever you guys need, we are here for you. Also, we want to open up a voicemail uh, inbox so that you guys can, in fact, call us and leave voicemails. We'll do voicemail stuff so you guys can engage more with us um, and help us to you know, make this more of a community with you and really allow you to be a part of this. If I'm going to have it on the thumbnails after this video from now on, but the number um, let's see if I can find it first. Jeez Louise. The number I think is nine. It's a weird number. It's a New York City number. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this this uh, code. But let's see if we can find it here really quickly while you guys are on the line. Give me one second. Okay. So the number is 929-359-3702. So if you call that number, you can leave a voicemail. It's, on, it's the Google Voice um, number and I'll get them and I will clip them and I'll put them in our videos and so your voice will be on here so tell us your name where you're from a little something about you you know why you're a Giants fan um, hopefully Eli Manning is the answer and you know we'll have some fun guys we'll get you guys involved and we'll get you guys on the, on this on the stream and on the on the channel regularly so we can have more fun with you uh, but as always my friends thank you so much for tuning into the video and we'll catch you guys on the next one